sorry, hold on. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, you guys are special because this is my first Zoom presentation. I've done a many, many in person, but uh, this will be my first Zoom. So uh, if I stumble around, uh, I apologize, but uh, I appreciate y'all um, hanging out. And uh, basically what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to give an overview of how to use the Maryland Biodiversity Project website and all the information that is available to you guys um, and, and how, how to navigate the site and what you can do on the website. We'll also talk about a lot of the projects that we're, we're working on. Um, and finally, how you guys can can add data to, to the website, to the database. Okay, so let's start. Um, imagine if you were walking in the woods one May out um, uh, in a beautiful day in a rich woods and you came across this gorgeous flower. And you're like, I'm pretty sure it's an orchid, but I'm not sure what kind it is. Imagine if there was a website where you could go to, where you could get a list of all the orchid species that have been found in Maryland. And not just that, but county distribution for all the species. And not just that, but photographs of all the orchid species that has been found in Maryland. That is basically the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Back in June of 2012, uh, my partner, uh, Bill Hubick, who started MVP with me, uh, him and I were at uh, Severn Run, which is a really cool natural area in Northern Anne Arundel County. And we came across this flower. Does anybody know what kind of flower this is? Put it in the chat box if you know what it is. <laughs> Anybody? So I didn't know what it was either when I saw it. <laughs> this is a world loosestrife. It's a native loosestrife. And it's pretty, it's fairly common flower of, of rich woods. But when I got home uh, and was trying to identify this plant, one of the things I realized was that Maryland did not have an up-to-date comprehensive plant checklist. Brown and Brown did one back in the late 70s. Um, and really up until, up until just a couple months ago, there, there wasn't any comprehensive plant checklist. And that kind of threw us for a loop. So Bill and I decided that we would make one. <laughs> So we went into all the databases like the USDA um, plants website and a lot of other, um, we use Brown and Brown and we created a web, uh, a list of all the native, of all the plants. And that kind of snowballed and Bill's like, you know, we should do this for everything. So within a couple months, the Maryland Biodiversity Project was born and basically uh, it, our goal was to make uh, an easily uh, viewed format where people could go and see complete lists of organisms found in the state. And we've grown to do a lot more than that. <laughs> so if you Google the Maryland Biodiversity Project, uh, this is what you're going to come to. It's our homepage. And there's a lot of information here. Um, up here, you'll see uh, our uh, Maryland Biodiversity Project is a 501c3 nonprofit. Our mission statement is uh, we're focused on cataloging the living things of, of Maryland. We promote conservation, science, and education by helping to build a vibrant nature study community. Um, underneath our mission statement, we have our special projects, which we'll talk about later on. 
Underneath that, we have announcements. And this is basically an area where if we add a new species to the website, we put it up there. Or if something special like the first state record of Kirtland's warbler, which happened just a few days ago in Baltimore City, uh, we, we, we put anything we feel is relevant to um, biodiversity in the state here in the announcement sections. And you can go, you can hit the more announcements and you can see basically all the announcements that I've ever we've ever done. But um, a new predatory fungus gnat was added recently by uh, Steve Shulnick. Uh, new, a new moth species by Tim Reichard and a new spider genus by Jim Moore. Um, so whenever we add new things, they get an announcement on the website. Underneath that, we have our numbers. So right now we have uh, 20,057 species in, in the checklist. Um, of those 20,000 species, 12,310 have photographs, which is pretty good. Um, we have a total of 453,000 photos total, and our records are coming up on 700,000 700, records in the database. Um, Underneath that, we have uh, whenever we add recent photos, um, they get put there. Uh, my my computer screen wasn't big enough, but if if you go to the if you go to the home page, you can see we list about twenty of the newest photos there, and those we add probably easily between five hundred and a thousand records a day. So that probably means close to 1,200 photos a day. Um, we burn through a lot of data. Um, over here, we have a, a slideshow. If you have a few hundred years, you could probably sit through and get see all of the 453,496 photos <laughs> that are in the, in the database. Um, uh, over here, we have a search box. This is where if you wanted to find photos of the Kirtland's warbler, you could type in Kirtland's warbler and it would take you straight to the species page. And over here underneath my photos here is a, is a donate button. Very, very important for a 501c3 to have that donate button. <laughs> so up, up here is our, uh, it's a toolbar and with drop down menus. So with vertebrates, you can see you can get a, you can click all, get a list of all the vertebrates, amphibians, fish, mammals, reptiles. If you click birds, you'd get a list of all of the 455 bird species that have been found in Maryland. Okay. So this list just goes on for all 455 and it gives you basically a, a taxonomic order here. Um, and you can click by family and just get the family. Um, say, uh, let's see here. Oops, sorry. Can you guys see the, the icons here? They can. Okay, so uh, this icon, is the camera icon, if you click that, you would get thumbnails of all of the bird photos. And you could just sit and look at all of our photos. If you click the <clears throat> globe, first globe icon, it would give you the county list for all the bird species, right? The next globe icon gives you a heat map by quad of all of our bird data, okay? So the, the darker the red, the more records we have from that quad, okay? So if you look like right in here, this area, this is where Blackwater is, right? Over here, Ocean City Inlet, Finzel Swamp and Finzel Swamps here and uh, Rocky Gap, um, all really big birding areas. And of course, bottom, the Baltimore area um, and the wa Baltimore Washington corridor always has the most data because that's where the most people are. <laughs> and the final icon is a, is a movie screen icon. And this basically just allows all the photos. If you wanted to have a Zen 
couple of minutes of Zen and just look at bird photos, you could just sit there and look through all the all the bird photos. So let's look at a spe uh, species page. So if you type brown headed nuthatch into the species page, this was this is what would come up. All of our species pages are the same, um, follow the same look. So you have the, the name, the scientific name, the authorship and the date the species was named, right? And then you have synonyms. So we have the banding code for, for brown headed nuthatch. You can click the camera icon and you can get thumbnails of all of our brown headed nuthatch photos that are in the database, right? <clears throat> Underneath that, we have a basic taxonomic tree from kingdom down to species. And under here, we have a county bar. If the county is shaded in green, that means we have records from that county, okay? Um, down, people didn't like the county bar thing and they wanted a map, so we made a map. <laughs> and the map is basically redundant of the county bar. If the county is shaded in green, then that means we have records. Now, uh, Charlie Davis got very upset with us that we did not include Baltimore City. So he, uh, he told us that we needed to include Baltimore City. Unfortunately, that was after we had made the map. So Baltimore City, if it has a record, it's dark green, if that makes sense. Um, up here, you can see that it's not shaded in. So that means we don't have a record. We were easily, we could easily put Baltimore City into the, into the county bar, but it was a little more difficult to add the shading um, in the map. Uh, the reason Baltimore City was not included in the original, in our original go with the website is that birders, which Bill and I come from the birding community, don't recognize Baltimore City. The, 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 the Maryland Ornithological Society counts Baltimore City as Baltimore County. Even I know it's strange. Um, and we just never thought twice about it. And luckily, Mr. Davis set us straight. And we, we now have separated out Baltimore City. <laughs> um, so if you drill, if you click the drill to quad map, you can get a quad map of all of our brown headed nuthatch sightings. And once again, these are gradient scaled. So the darker the purple, the more records. Okay. So you can see right here, this is black water. So that's where that's where a lot of people go to see brown headed nut nut hatches. Um, and I'm sure we have over many hundreds of records of brown headed nut hatch from there. Also, Point Lookout is a really good place. Underneath that, we have a we have some information areas. Uh, we have a status bar description, where to find re and relationships. Um, now, not all of the twenty thousand species has the information areas filled out. We're slowly but surely filling out filling them out as we as we have time. Um, but a lot of the more common species do. So you can see like. Uh, um, for the brown hooded nuthatch, it's common on the eastern shore in Loblolly Pines. Um, the description, uh, it, um, you know, base, we just give basic information. So it's Maryland's smallest nuthatch, the brown cap, and the, and the calls are diagnostic. Um, where to find uh, Loblolly Pine stands on the eastern shore. Um, <clears throat> for relationships, this is, the, to me, this is the most interesting field. This is where you get like host plant data for butterflies and moths and things like that. Um, so really you could say that the brown the headed nuthatch host plant is a loblolly pine because they are rarely found outside of loblolly pine habitat. So what you can do is you can click on loblolly pine and then it will take you to the loblolly pine page, right? Um, and it's this, you can see it's the same basic format. Um, <clears throat> and 
once again, you know, very common on the coastal plain. It gives you a, a way to, uh, in the description, to differentiate from other pines. Um, where to find, go to the lower eastern shore where it's the dominant plant. Um, and down here with relationships, we talk about the brown-headed nuthatch, and we also say it's a uh, it's host to various moth species, including southern pine sphinx, webbing coneworm moth. If you clicked southern pine sphinx, you would go to the southern pine sphinx uh, page. And once again, you could click loblolly pine and go back and back and forth and back and forth. So the chestnut-sided warbler. This is one of my absolute favorite breeding birds in Maryland. It's just this photo by Frode Jacobson, I think is one of the most gorgeous photos on the site. Um, and I, I like to show it off. Um, one of the cool things with our bird pages is we're starting to add a lot of audio. So you can click in here, um, bird songs. We have also added a lot of cricket songs. Um, I don't know if anybody does the cricket crawl um, thing every summer. Um, our site's a good site to go and hear a lot of the crickets. Um, amphibians, the frogs and things like that. We're slowly adding. We don't have everything up, but we're slowly starting to add it um, audio to mo a lot of our species pages as we get them. But for the birds, uh, for every bird um, species page, you can click the view full eBird range map and it will give you a range map, global range map for every bird species that's found in Maryland. And once again, this is gradient. So you can see that winters, they winter down in Central America and most breeding occurs up in uh, the boreal forests. Miles. Hey, yes. Hey, Jim. Could you go back to the um, slide that you had for the loblolly pine? Heidi sure. noticed that some counties were green and some were black, and she didn't know what that meant. Yeah, and that's a good catch, and I knew it as soon as I saw it. So, <laughs> what you see here is my personal species page. <laughs> So the brown is where I have seen loblolly pine. And I apologize for not having the, uh, the I, that's a good catch. I didn't even catch that after looking at the presentation 25 times. But basically, uh, Bill and I have special powers <laughs> because we made the site and we keep track of our own data on there. So when we uh, plug into the website, sign in, we get to see where we've, you know, it's basically like our life list, county lists, um, if that answers your question. All right. So moths. Um, mothing has become quite the thing in the past few years. Uh, some people would say it's always been a thing, but with the National Moth Week and uh, uh, it, it moths have been getting a ton of attention and um, we have a lot of moth enthusiasts that uh, uh, <clears throat> send data to us on a regular basis. Um, so we have tried for most of the more common species to have um, host plant data up. Um, but one of the cool things is in the links, you, you can hit view and moth photographers group. If you hit that link, you can get a global idea of, or not global, in the North America where every species is found. And that really helps. If you think you found a, a new moth or, you know, uh, something special, you can go and just make sure that your the data syncs up with what you're looking at. It, it's very helpful. Comet darn. This is one of my favorite Maryland insects. Now, what I'm going to do next is basically give you a behind the scenes of what the database looks like. So for every species, uh, this is what our database looks like when we go to view it, if Bill and I are in there. Basically, every record has a number, the name, the date, 
the county, a location, the comments, and it can tell us what kind of data it is. If it has a photo, it has a photo icon. If it's a specimen, we have a specimen icon. If it's from literature, if the record's from literature, we'll know if it's a published uh, data. And then we have who, um, the rec who, who submitted the record and who put the record into the database. So it would just be wonderful if we could just have open access and share all this data with the public, I mean, that would be my dream. But unfortunately, it's just not realistic. Um, mainly, you guys can figure out why, you know, poaching and, you know, with the reptiles, with the herps and with the orchids and things. Um, so what we decided was when we started out that basically the most finite detail that we would give the public would be quad level. And there's a list of, and we, we, we talked with, you know, a lot of the people in the natural heritage program, you know, we're, we're friends with a lot of those people, you know, we want to make sure that everybody's comfortable with the amount of data we're giving the public, right? We want to give as much as possible without making people squeamish. Um, so after much deliberation, it came down basically to quad level was, was a good, good uh, <clears throat> finite, you know, level um, for the data sharing. Um, so, yeah. So this is our, <clears throat> another really cool thing is our uh, bibliography. Whenever we enter data from any peer-reviewed journal or uh, get a list of, of, of species data from experts in their field, it always goes into our bibliography. The bibliography is awesome. There is just a ton of data here, and we've arranged it by category. So if you're like into algae, there right there, there's like 12 things, you know, I mean, just if, if you were going to write a paper or looking to do basic research, I would highly recommend you just going to see what we have first, we might save you a little bit of time. So here is another quad heat map. This is a quad heat map of all the data in MBP. Okay. Now you can see up in the top left-hand corner, it says species represented 18,868, right? So you're thinking, but you said there was 20,000 species. So why aren't there 20,000 species? Does anybody want to throw out an answer? This hasn't been updated. No, no, it's updated. <laughs> <laughs> so not all of our data can be mapped to quad level, right? So a lot of data that we have comes from, um, you know, like uh, I'm trying to think um, some of the <clears throat> more obscure beetles and things like that come from published state lists and they might give county um, but not necessarily a, a finite location that can't be tracked to map to quad level. So of the 20,000 species we have in the database, 1,500 can't be mapped to quad level, which is a pretty good percentage of, of the quad level. And you can see when you look at it, the Baltimore Washington corridor is just where we get most of our data. And that's mainly because that's the population, you know, that's where most people live. Um, if you look out in the West, you can see, you know, Frostburg's right there near Cumberland. And so that's the Finzel Swamp, you know, Rocky Gap area. Um, this, this right here, uh, underneath, underneath Hagerstown, the, the quad, MB, that's uh, uh, Middle, Middleburg quad, I think. 
can't remember exactly in between Hagerstown and Frederick, you see the red quad. That's where Mark Etheridge lives and he does moss at his house. <laughs> so that quad is like, he has like uh, an astronomical amount of species from, from his house. We have, um, I don't know if anybody knows Gary Hevel. He's an entomologist at the Smithsonian. He's the guy, he lives in Tacoma Park, <clears throat> excuse me. And he's like recorded over uh, some uh, like 8,000 species of insects in his yard. And we have all of his data. Um, so he lived, you know, one of the, one of the quads in the, that's really dark to the east of Washington, you know, the Tacoma Park quad is Gary's quad. Um, but it's a lot of fun to look at. So if you wanted to know, <clears throat> if you were out and about and wanted to know what quad you're in, it's really easy to figure that out. If you go to the home page and under the explore menu, you hit Maryland quad map, right? You can see it. It's right here. Um, it will give you a quad map over top of Google Maps and you can just click the quad, right? So I click the Baltimore West quad. All right. Now, the cool thing is you can go back. Um, if you go to the quad heat map, which is right under the quad map under the explore menu on the homepage. Oops, sorry. You can uh, click Baltimore West, right? You can see that there's been 1,241 species recorded from that quad in our database. Um, you can hit the view the quad list and it will give you the list of all the stuff that we've recorded from that quad. Minus the endangered stuff, the, the, the S1 and S2s, uh, a lot of that stuff um, DNR doesn't want us to show to quad level. And we'll get into more of that in a minute. But you can also click, see who the top observers are in the quad. Um, so Peter Martin is, as of earlier this week, had 238 species from the quad. And I'm down, I think I'm number nine. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes any of those people, but um, so we, we get a lot of, a lot of data from, from that area. So Palmides swallowtail. This is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful of the Maryland butterflies. <clears throat> it is, considered endangered in the state. You can see right to the right of the name, we have a couple tags there. Endangered in Maryland, S1, highly state rare, coastal plain only. Palmides swallowtail is only found in Southern Worcester County where its host plant Swamp Bay grows. Swamp Bay reaches its northern population, northern limit in Worcester County. So does the Palmetti swallowtail. But you say, look, it's been seen in Montgomery, Baltimore, PG, and Arundel. Those are all strays. Um, it does stray. People do see, but most of those records are single or double records. Not, you know, it's it's not common anywhere, really. But if you want to see one, you'd have to go to Worcester County um, with any, if you wanted to see one with any regularity. Now the tags are really important. Um, you can, this is where we do like uh, endangered, We if it's threatened, um, if it's uh, <clears throat> S1, S2, S3, these are designations that are given by the Natural Heritage Program to designate the population size. So S1 is, I think, one to five populations in the state, and S2 would be six to 20, and S3, which is watch list, would be like 21 to 40 or so. I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the watch list numbers. But if, if, if you have an S, if you're a species and have an S ranking, that means it's pretty rare, pretty uncommon. So whenever an um, we list all of the state ranked species and we uh, we follow the natural heritage heritage uh, programs designation. So 
The Palmetti Swallowtail, like I said, is endangered in Maryland. It's an S1, highly state rare, which means it only has one to five populations in the state, and it's only found on the coastal plain. Um, you can click any of our tags. So if you click the endangered tag, you get a list of all the endangered animals and plants, okay? If you click the S1 tag, you get a list of all the S1 animals and plants, right? Which is kind of handy if you wanted to look for rare species. <clears throat> What's that horribleness we see growing there on the screen? <laughs> Anybody gonna throw out an answer? It's the scourge of the South. Everybody's saying kudzu. Excellent, right on, right on. Um, it is kudzu. Um, so if we go to the kudzu page, you can see the tags are non-native invasive. So if a species is considered not native, we say non-native. If it's listed under the state invasive species list, we give it the invasive species tag. Um, if you click invasive, you can get a list of all of the invasive species that are found in Maryland. Now this list can be interpreted in many different ways. One person's invasive species is another person's favorite garden plant. Um, we understand that that terminology isn't necessary, can be a little fluid. So we just go strictly by what Maryland state law says for invasive species. There are, in my opinion, a lot more invasive species in the state, but we're not going to give them the invasive species tag, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so you can see we're going to go to our special projects. Uh, <clears throat> this year we started a lot of um, new new projects, which we're really excited about. Um, if you see the Turkey Point bird count, so back in August uh, 5th, August first, we started the first Turkey Point bird count. We hired uh, Daniel Irons, who was uh, a birding phenom from uh, Centerville, Maryland, not Centerville, Kent Island. And he, uh, he has been our counter. Every morning, Daniel Irons counts all the migrating birds that fly past Turkey Point. It's awesome. Um, it's just like, I don't know if anybody has been to Cape May to Higby Beach to see their morning flight counts, it's the same thing, except we're doing it at Turkey Point. Bill and I had always wanted to establish a, uh, a morning flight count here in Maryland. And we finally, uh, with the board's permission, started, started it this year. We wanted to do it last year, but COVID got in the way. Um, and we have been getting some amazing numbers from Turkey Point. Does every, everybody knows where Turkey Point is? It's in between, it's the, it's the peninsula that comes down in between the Susquehanna River and the Elk River, right at the top of the bay, right? So basically it comes like a, an ice cream cone, Turkey Point does, and birds just funnel down the peninsula at the head of the bay and fly off south um, in the fall. So this will be the first time ever that we get a full season of migratory bird data from a single location, um, a daily numbers um, from a single location, uh, which is really, really exciting. And what you guys can do if you're interested is you can go and we have a running tally every morning of all the birds that Daniel sees. Right. So you can go down the screen on the, if you click the Turkey Point thing from the homepage, 
you can see all the birds that he's seeing in real time, right? So if he's having an amazing sharp shinned hawk migration day, you can watch the numbers change while you're sitting at the computer, right? Um, Turkey Point has a phenomenal number of blue jays that have been migrating through the past few weeks. We're over on, we're up around uh, oh, close to 2,000 blue jays have flown through Turkey Point in the past week, which is really awesome. Really, really cool. The other projects that we've been doing is we've been doing um, nocturnal insect surveys. Uh, myself, along with Emilio Concari and Dave Webb and Tim Reichert and Mark Etheridge, we've been doing uh, targeting uh, <clears throat> quads that don't have a lot of insect data. So um, this year, I spent most of my time um, in the salt marshes, setting up black lights and recording all the insects that came into the black light. And we have been getting some phenomenal data, a lot of new species for the state. Um, it's just been a real eye opener that we really don't know what's going on out there. Um, we've also had some discouraging things, you know, numbers are not what they used to be, according to a lot of the people that have been doing this for a long time. And, uh, you know, the more data we get, the more answers, you know, we can try to, you know, the more questions we can try to answer with the data. So we're, we're going to really start hitting the nocturnal insect surveys hard over the next coming, uh, next few years. And we're going to try to go to those places in the state that might have you know, fallen through the cracks, gotten neglected. Um, a lot of a lot of neat areas that are outside of the normal scientific data areas. <laughs> um, so we're we're really really excited about that. <clears throat> and there's some pictures from our from some of our nights out doing the moth collections. Uh, mine in the middle here. This is my buddy Tom Field and I set up at Truett's Landing. Um, uh, on the coastal bays, if you if you were looking to the east, you'd see Assateague Island, right? So you're right on the water, right on the edge of a salt marsh. It's really really neat. Um, down here on the bottom uh, left hand side is one of Dave Webb set up. He he's he's got the granddaddy of all lights shining there. I'm very jealous of his light setup. Um, but it's really fun, and we're getting just getting some really incredible data. So why are we doing this? Really, what does it all come down to? You know, the nuts and bolts of all this. Um, can anybody tell me what this butterfly is? Does anybody know? We're getting crickets, not butterfly. Okay, that's cool. So it's not... It's, it's a butterfly that is not commonly encountered anymore. This is a bronze copper. And this butterfly used to be extremely, extremely common on the Eastern shore and coastal plain and even in the Piedmont. But in the past 20 years, the population has just crashed, right? You can't find these things anymore. Um, they, they have disappeared from many of their known sites and really um, it just kind of disappeared off the face of, of the state. You know, they're not, they're not around anymore. So what happens when a common species all of a sudden becomes rare, right? The Natural Heritage Program isn't tracking it. So all of a sudden you have a species that becomes rare and there's no data. You don't even know where it used to be found, right? We were able to give DNR over 40 locations for bronze copper because we had locality data for this butterfly. Now, most of those locations are, they, they're not there anymore, but a few we found, you know, um, with a little bit of looking. But you know, it's it's the kind of thing. 
I like to say, how do we know what we're losing if we don't know what we have, right? So when when people ask me, well, why do you care about tiger swallowtail numbers? Like, well, we don't know why, you know, if or when a population might crash. You know, 100 years down the road, we hope our database is still going well and people can say, I can't believe that was rare back then. It's everywhere now. You know, maybe maybe we're going to get everything together and <laughs> save the world, you know. Um, but that's this. Uh, the bronze copper is a great example of why we feel it's important to do, you know, what we're doing with MBP. Um, <clears throat> so. How do you guys give us data? It's a great question. And it took us many years to figure out a method that most people would agree with is good. We have partnered with iNaturalist. I hope that everybody is at least a little familiar with iNaturalist. Um, it's a great way to it's a great companion to MVP. Um, iNaturalist basically what you can do is you can log your sightings into the iNaturalist database. If you log in a sighting in Maryland, that automatically gets put in the Maryland Biodiversity Project queue, right? And then just because you tell us that you saw a bronze copper doesn't necessarily mean that we automatically put it into the database. We're really, really stringent about vetting the records. And a lot of people kind of get you know, upset that it takes so long for their data to get in or why isn't this included? You included this, but not this. And you know, we just have to say, sorry, you know, I'm not an expert in this type of beetle. You know, we rely on other experts to verify your record. So as a lot of people know, with iNaturalist, they give, <clears throat> I don't want to say validity ranking, but if more than two people agree on the identification of your record, it becomes research grade. We don't necessarily play by those rules. The only way for your record to get into MVP is to get verified by somebody that we deem an expert. And we have a list of like 150 people who we, um, if they agree, if they identify one of your records, then it automatically gets put into the MVP database, right? Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? I know that a couple people were interested in this and I wanna make sure that everybody has a real clear understanding about that. You can unmute if you'd like to uh, ask for clarification or put it in the chat box. I think people understand. Yep. Awesome. That's great. Very, very cool. Okay. Well, for the final slide. Oh, this, do yep. ask, so do you have to make your photo public in some way for it to be included? No, no. Now, um, Are we ever, so let me answer um, Sue's question first. Um, Sue, no, you don't have to make it public, but we ask that you allow us to have access to the data. And basically what happens is, uh, so I'm not, I'm not the computer wizard part of the team. I deal more in the data, 
Bill Hubick, my my partner at MVP, is is the behind the scenes wizard that makes everything gorgeous and beautiful and works seamlessly. And what he would do is he would send you a personal message asking you to allow us to see see your data. Um, it doesn't really if if you don't want us to know the data. You know, it doesn't really do us a lot of good because we don't have, you know, a granular locality data. It's, it's you know, it's just a county record. And if it's private, we don't even know what county it's in. Does that make sense, Sue? Yeah, it says that Sue got one of those messages. I got one of those messages from Bill, too. And I, I yeah, thought it was pretty good. cool. Good, good, and great. So one... One thing I'd like to stress is we do not give out any data to willy nilly. You know, we don't, if you sent me an email and I didn't know who you are asking me for orchid locations, you would not get a response from me. We give our data to a lot of institutions. You know, it's a, it's a science thing. You know, we, if, 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 if somebody is doing research, that kind of thing, yes, we would give information. If it's a sensitive species, we would not, you know, we'd really have to um, trust you, if that makes sense. Um, uh, are we ever told if our record is used in the project? Um, yes, if, if you're, if you, um, if you're, I think it shows on iNaturalist in the bottom right hand corner, it says Maryland Biodiversity Project. Um, I think that means that it's in the data in, in the database, Bill. Okay, Sue, good. Is there a, ah, you know, um, that that's a that's a justice that's a great. Great question. Is there a list of greatest needs, the type of data we can help gather? So to answer that question, what we would really, really like, you can go, let me, uh, let me see if I can. So uh, if you look at this slide, you can see the little uh, glass icon here next to the common name, that means we have photos of that, right? We are really trying hard to get photos of all of our species. So if you, one of the coolest things would be when we get a new photo species, that's almost as awesome as a new species. <laughs> so one of the things we really like to do is get photos of, um, the things we don't have photos of. Does that is does that answer your question, Justice? The, the another thing is if you look at the if you look at a heat map, I don't, so all these light green and blue quads, they don't have any data. I mean some of these some of these quads only have like 40 or 50 records. So you can go in and quad bustings awesome that i i really enjoy that this sunday my buddy tom and i are going to go down to the mechanicsville quad which is i think this one and we're going to do a lot of uh plant busting down there to try to get the quad list higher so um any any new quad records are always great too so <clears throat> judy um it's the list that DNR uses for their invasive species. I, a Maryland state list. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the list, what the uh, uh, proper name is for that invasive species list. It's the one that was given to us by Natural Heritage Program. DNR, uh, Department of Natural Resources. Very cool. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, real quick show my 
my favorite slide of all on the website. Is that cool. not the coolest picture in the world? <laughs> you can see the reflection of the photographer in the eyes of the, of the spider. That's just it. Every time I see that it just blows my mind how awesome that is. And that's it, guys. If, if, if anybody has any questions, I will answer everyone that comes our way. Hey, Jim, thanks. Can yep. you stop share? We'll come back together and we'll do, we'll do a, a quick Q&A. Stop share. Yep. Is that it? All right. That's it. Okay, cool. Does anybody have any questions? You can raise your hand. You can put it in the chat box. I have a question and as people are formulating theirs in their head. Um, you know, we have at the Natural History Society collections of, 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 of animals and plants from Maryland that have been collected and with the data associated. Do you go and um, utilize the data from different natural history collections? Like the yeah, plants, so there. Yep. So <laughs> yes, short answer. <laughs> Long answer is um, people, organizations can be um, are very, <laughs> how do I say this? Uh, are very attached to their data, right? And it's not given out willy-nilly, right? Um, so um, I know like uh, we have uh, the herbarium at Mary University of Maryland. We have that in the database. Um, we have a lot of Jim Young's data. I think he is one of the curators of the Lepidoptera at Natural History Society. Um, but we don't have a lot of your data. And if you would be willing to share, we would love that. And we should talk more. <laughs> we will. I mean, it, ours is not digitized. So we're in the process of doing that. So it's, once that happens, I think that the sharing will become uh, uh, be, become easier. Awesome. Uh, I would, I would, let's talk about that more for sure. Um, Alan asked if there's going to be a mobile app. Um, we have uh, been working on the <clears throat> on the way that the website is viewed uh, mobily. Um, realistically, probably not in the near future. Um, iNaturalist has a great mobile app. They work; it works well on the phone. Although I still prefer to come home and use my desktop for doing iNaturalist, but I know a lot of people enjoy using it in the field. Um, doing, doing an app, it, I think that right now our, our funding would be better uh, used towards, you know, doing our data gathering like the turkey point bird count and the nocturnal insect surveys. Hey Jim, I have a couple of questions that came directly to me. Um, yep. Are there, uh, Kelly wants to know, are there partnerships with citizen groups like the Maryland Master Naturalist Program to collect data and observations with you? So I, I have um, given a lot of talks to many different nat uh, Master Naturalist groups. Um, we haven't uh, partnered with the Master Naturalist uh, formally. Um, I know that we've helped a lot of master naturalists get their certification. Um, we've worked with a lot of uh, a lot of the different parks, University of Maryland. Um, uh, we, we've done some stuff with the Smithsonian. Um, basically, it's been on uh, small group or individual research levels. You know, if if uh, if. Uh, if a biologist is doing work on a certain plant or something like that, uh, we will, you know, advise and offer help uh, whenever we can. But with the mat, we haven't with the mat master naturalist groups, um, we haven't really partnered per se with the organization. 
And um, Bob wants to know where the Kirtland's Warbler was. Swan Park? Is that, I, I don't know where it is. I, and I, I'm, my fingers are crossed that it stays until Saturday morning so I can go and see it because that would be my 400th bird in Maryland. <laughs> so. <laughs> yep, we got Matthew agreed it was Swan Park. Judy Good. has her hand. Hi. Yes, Judy. Hi. <laughs> Um, so I've been working a lot on invasive uh, species, and um, I would be interested in following up with you about um, the DNR list that you use, uh, because I have access to more complete lists. Yeah, um, that would be great. Um, like, like I said before, when, when we start throwing around the labels, it, it becomes, um, we need to be careful <laughs> that if that makes sense um, about throwing the invasive species label around, even though, like I said, our, in my opinion, our list does not label as many invasive species as there actually are. And, you know, um, I, I will, if, I have your email, Judy. I, I will find out where we got that list. What and and send you the um, send you the link to where we where we found it. Because if, for instance, you're using the Maryland Invasive Species Species Council list, if the DNR is giving that to you, that's deliberately meant to not be complete. It's meant to only have certain species on it. Right, right. So again, we can have a discussion about that. It doesn't need sure. to boring other people. <laughs> no problem. I would be more than happy to go into it more with you. Great. So, great. Jim, Chandra wants to know what original sources were used to gather original data and do you do any sort of taxonomic validation for synonymous names? Yeah, so um, first off, uh, we do not, so like for our plant list comes from the 2021 NAP, uh, Wesley NAP, Rob Nasi, Maryland state plant list that was just published. And luckily we've had access to that list for the past five or six years while they were working on it. Um, so we can say, you know, if you're like, oh, I don't believe in that plants here, I can say, well, you need to talk to West Knapp about that. <laughs> you know, um, uh, many of our, um, you know, the bird list comes from the Maryland Ornithological Society. Um, so, you know, we we don't just willy nilly assemble lists, um, a, and a lot of the lists aren't complete, right? So. You know, I know that we don't have every beetle that's ever been found in the state on the website, right? But, you know, we have um, uh, Mr. Ms. Dr. Staines, uh, Char Charlie Staines, he, and, and Warren Steiner, um, all, you know, Warren Steiner is a darkling beetle expert who works at the Smithsonian and he keeps the Maryland list, which he has shared with us. You know, that's how we <clears throat> get most of our species lists. And how does it how are you, I, I am, oh, sorry. It's okay. So you, if it's an original list, you know, maybe from a long time ago, and you put it on there. Um, I'm sure it's it. The data has when it was when it was seen, and so is that how you're making the um, kind of connecting the dots of if if something just hasn't been seen for a long time, or you know, how is it? Is it there's no way to track trends on the Maryland. It's or, or it's is there? it well. Not really. Um, so we don't we don't track effort, um, and that's we had to make that decision early on. So the data 
base is presence absence. Um, now, we do have so much data of some species that, sci that scientists have actually been able to figure effort out if there's enough data for a certain species. Um, and that's a little bit beyond my pay grade. <laughs> um, I went the, the, the previous about tsunami. Um, I'm trying to think of plants are probably the easiest way to think of synonyms. You know, some plants have 12 synonyms and whenever we find a synonym, we put it on the species page. So you can, in the search box, you can search by anything, any of the synonyms that we have. So, um, you know, that works well with whatever name that you know. And if you find, if you find a synonym, if you have a synonym or something that we don't have, please send it to us and we'll just add it. We're good with that. All right. So this is so almost like a an ongoing bio blitz for Maryland. That's right. A bio blitz, an everyday bio blitz that will last forever, hopefully. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions for Jim? Doris mentioned something about a booklet from the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Plant Invaders of the Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I, I have a copy. Um, Using that invasive tag is really tricky. That's it's it's really tricky. And I know I know you guys are probably thinking that's a cop out, but it gets it legally even it gets it gets tricky throwing that around. Um, so we we err on the side of caution and uh, go with the list that was given to us by the state. Well, thank you, Jim. Everybody is uh, saying thank you and um, looking around and they all look a lot smarter and they all look motivated to get out there and add their data. Yes, please. To, yes, uh, please. Um, one, one final thing. Uh, if you ever need to get in touch with us, the easiest way to do it is um, you can find me at iNaturalist um, at Jim Brighton. Um, if you need, uh, if you think your records haven't been seen, uh, you can always tag me, tag away. I will sit there all night long and verify records. Um, um, so, you know, please, please utilize the iNaturalist tag if you want me to look at your records. I'll gladly do it. And don't forget to hit that donate button on the yes, button please. project. <laughs> Next time you're on there looking and, and absorbing and swimming and Thank all you, of that data, uh, <laughs> send, send, a, send a couple of bucks over to the to the project so they can keep doing what they're doing. And, and it's an incredible resource for, for us all. And we're very lucky that it started um, with, a, with the plant in the 2012. Yep. Yeah. Um, so next next year, next year is our tenth year anniversary, and we got a lot of cool stuff planned. So stay tuned. Wonderful, and I look forward to finding new ways that we can partner together um, to to keep this going. I would enjoy that. That would be awesome. That would be great. And thanks everybody for joining us on Must Learn Thursday. I hope we'll see you next week um, for. Uh, the slugs of Maryland and the um, fossil day, national fossil day, where you can get free fossils. Remember to RSVP so we have enough to give away to everybody. But come and see us on uh, October 13th from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, in person. So um, that's it. Stay well, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious, everybody. See you later. Bye. Thank you.